and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Do you ever just sit and watch your sleeping dog? Observe as their little feet run along the ground, just waving halfway in the air as they let out innocent, half-gruntled barks. Have you ever just wondered what's going on inside their sleeping minds? What they're dreaming about? Maybe it's a squirrel they're chasing, or a ball. Maybe they're simply enjoying time with their life partners, their owners, their best friends. Or maybe what's going on is something entirely different, lurking just beyond the realm of what we can possibly comprehend. Something so terrible we'd be better off in the gleeful shadow of ignorance. I wish I could tell you this was all just speculation. Crazy ideas conjured up by a bored mind. But the truth is that I've seen what exists inside the mind of a sleeping dog. And it terrifies me beyond what I ever imagined possible. The idea of mind reading itself is an old one. And while it might sound like something taken out of a science fiction novel, we do possess devices that can give a basic translation of what occurs inside an individual's resting mind. In reality, in a dumbed-down version of neurology, everything we think, dream, and feel is a product of chemicals and electrical signals surging through our flesh, producing a flux of ideas and emotions which results in pretty much everything we are. With the right equipment, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to translate these impulses into text, audio, or even images. That's what I've been working on for the past decade. A device that not only reads the electrical impulses within your brain, but one that can also give a basic picture of what's going on. It might sound horrifying enough on its own, but don't fall into a pit of despair. This is nothing to be used as a torture device or to extract information from unwilling participants. This was always planned to aid those no longer able to communicate with the world surrounding them. People suffering from locked-in syndrome, unable to speak, but fully conscious, horrified as they've lost the ability to interact with the people around them. The device we worked on was supposed to aid them, give them a way of talking to their friends and family, to let us know they're still in there. The project itself was called Dreamweaver and came in the form of a hairnet containing hundreds of tiny electrodes able to read the brain's electrical signals from the surface of the skin. Much like encephalography, it read brain waves, but unlike the standard EEG, it was also capable of translating them. Even from the very early prototypes, we were able to pick up some vague shapes and sounds from our first test subject, which just so happened to be me. Both while awake and asleep, we managed to reproduce my thoughts, displaying them on a nearby monitor and then recording them. Awkwardly enough, the first dream happened to be erotic in nature, witnessed by all four of my fellow scientists, laughing hysterically as I was forced to confirm that they were, in fact, my dreams. But regardless of how embarrassed I felt, we were all ecstatic to have taken such a massive leap forward in science. After that first successful but slightly awkward attempt, we decided it would be more professional to find a third party of willing and hopefully shameless volunteers to share both their conscious and unconscious thoughts. A couple of weeks went by and we recorded grainy, hardly intelligible thoughts and dreams from about a dozen people, each aiding us in our goal to properly calibrate the Dreamweaver device and to translate the signals. The main problem that we quickly discovered was that while our technology was state-of-the-art, the human mind was simply too complex to easily translate. There's too much noise, too many emotions, and an overabundance of useless information stored in our high-functioning brains, all making it difficult to properly read anyone's thoughts with a high level of accuracy. Then, one of my colleagues suggested we take a step back 
and start over with a more primitive creature. One that we can confirm has dreams, emotions, and thoughts. But to a lesser extent, humanity's best friends, dogs. Yes, we could have used more primitive primates, but that meant time had to be spent on an excessive amount of paperwork. Dogs were more readily available. I was quick to volunteer up my own best friend, Robbie, as our very first animal test subject. He spent most of his days sleeping away or eating anyway, so having us monitor his dreams wouldn't make much of a difference. All we needed was an endless supply of snacks, and he'd happily drift off and snore wherever and whenever he could. It was something I'd noticed even as Robbie was a puppy. One who'd just eaten a half a pizza he found lying on a bench, swallowed in just a few seconds before I could stop him. Being a Bernese mountain dog pushing 100 pounds, carrying him home even back then, was a tremendously difficult task. I brought him to the sleep lab accompanied by his favorite toy, blanket, and a bag of snacks sufficient to put him into a coma for a couple of hours. As predicted, it didn't take more than a half an hour of enough petting and feeding before Robbie fell fast asleep on top of his blanket, snoring like a tractor and wearing the Dreamweaver. Now, we just had to wait for Robbie to go through the stages of sleep before finally reaching REM, the interval of dreaming. The image appeared quickly, just vague outlines at first, hardly resembling anything more than abstract art. But as we calibrated the machine, we quickly managed to conjure an image clearer than anything we'd seen in a human being. A remarkably accurate representation of Robbie's mind, vivid beyond what we thought possible. We saw the picture from Robbie's point of view, him running through what looked like a narrow alley, the ground full of debris, metal, and other junk. He sniffed frantically around, periodically lifting his head to reveal thick black smoke obscuring the view above. He stopped and barked. Not a threat, but one calling out for someone before he kept moving through the alley and onto the main street. Just like the alleyway, it was poorly maintained, full of cracks and covered by various trash. Most of the buildings around were on the brink of collapse, with one of them engulfed in wild flames that shot far up into the sky above. Robbie instinctively ran over to the burning building, defying his usually cowardly soul, and stood outside, growling at it. Before long, a woman burst out from the front door, her clothes on fire as she screamed in a mixture of horror and agony. He chased after her while she ran around in panic, only lying down in a hopeless attempt at extinguishing the flames. All the while, Robbie barked at the fire, not understanding that it wasn't a living creature, a thing he couldn't scare away. He just saw something moving around the woman, hurting her, and he wanted so desperately to help. It was a futile fight, and the woman couldn't escape the heat. Within a couple of minutes, her skin had melted, with her hair burned away, and her own eyes turned to goo inside her skull. After what must have felt like an eternity of pain, she suffocated from the smoke and fell silent on the ground. Then Robbie woke up. He shot to his feet as he quickly inspected his surroundings, the horrible dream fading rapidly from his easily distracted mind. Once he noticed me there by his side, he immediately returned from worry to joy, violently wagging his tail and jumping up to lick my face. I petted him and smiled at his dumb, loyal face that had long since forgotten the dream. On the inside, however, I was filled with terror. What the hell had we just witnessed? Right then, I wished for nothing more than to be able to verbally communicate with my dog. The device we'd invented read minds, but it did little to translate it back to animals. There were too many questions for me to even begin. The main one being, how did he come up with such a horrific scenario? I'd had Robbie since he was nothing but a tiny puppy, small enough to fit in one hand. Destruction, fire, death, I mean, these were all concepts he shouldn't even understand, let alone have the ability to recreate in such an apocalyptic scene. A nightmare to match anything I'd ever experienced myself. After a short discussion with my colleagues, we decided to keep Robbie at the lab for a few more nights, check if the dream was a one-time event, or if there were thoughts and worries that haunted him each and every night. Robbie, naturally, loved the extra attention he received at the lab and couldn't be happier. 
For the next week, we kept him close, feeding him and making sure he felt comfortable enough to spend a sufficient amount of time sleeping. While most of his dreams were exactly what one would expect from a dog, running through the woods, chasing butterflies, eating all the food in the world, about a third of his dreams were exactly the nightmares we witnessed during the first experiment. A post-apocalyptic wasteland filled with the corpses of animals and humans just rotting away on the already broken streets, surrounded by collapsed buildings and a sky so consumed by smoke that the sun was nothing but a faint memory. In some of the still standing buildings I could recognize, landmarks from our city that Robbie hadn't even seen his entire life. Yet there they were in his dreams, as clear as my own memories of them. He saw our ancient local cinema, our apartment building, the park, and the history museum. He traversed the desolate streets in search of any sentient life, but only came across bones of those long since dead, debris, and leafless trees looming over the streets. Whatever had happened to the world, it had caused utter destruction beyond repair, and if humanity had endured, they were nowhere to be seen. It wouldn't be until the fifth recording before Robbie finally came across another person stumbling aimlessly through the ruins. He collapsed to the street before he even noticed my dog, and it quickly became apparent that he too was standing on death's doorstep. Robbie wandered over and licked the stranger's face, whimpering as he attempted to wake him back up. His shirt had been torn and a partially healed, severely infected wound covered most of his bloated abdomen. He briefly opened his eyes and smiled weakly at the friendly creature, there to see him off as he passed over to the other side of life. Once he let out his last breath, Robbie lay down beside him and cried, left alone in a broken world. Days passed, and we kept monitoring his dreams. The story they told was broken into different pieces and was hard to put together or to understand from a dog's point of view, but they always displayed destruction. And Robbie wandering through the lonely world, hopelessly searching for someone he'd probably never find. Me. Now, it could have been a terrible coincidence that my dog simply had the most creative imagination of any animal on the planet. I prayed that his dreams were mere fiction rather than a look into our bleak future. But if the world he dreamed up wasn't real, then how could he invent real places he'd never seen? Once we'd been sufficiently horrified by Robbie's unconscious mind, we decided it would be best to confirm our findings by monitoring other pets. A control group of animals from various places in the country, all who'd lived a long and happy life with their owners, safe from all the terrors in the world. We patiently waited as dog and cat owners signed up for the experiment, and while the pay wasn't all that great, they were more than excited to get a quick view into their loving pets' minds. Yeah, after all, there wasn't any harm in the project, and they were given plenty of attention and food to compensate for the new environment. After we gathered a couple of dozen volunteers, we got to work monitoring both their waking and sleeping minds, each for a week. We recorded their dreams and showed it to their owners after the fact, to prevent them from being exposed to the same nightmares we'd witnessed. Yeah, our plan was simple. If they had normal dreams, we'd just give them a copy of it on a USB stick. And if not, we would blame it on equipment malfunction and pay them their fee. No harm done. Most of the animals showed little more than your average dog catching a stick or a cat playing with yarn. And as we got through to the fifth, sixth, and even seventh subject without another incident, we almost allowed ourselves to fall back into blissful ignorance. But then we saw another nightmare. It was remarkably similar, a barren hellscape devoid of any sentient life. Just pets roaming the ruins, looking for anyone to keep them company at the end of the world. One cat dreamed of a minute society in the middle of the wasteland. Just 20 or so people clinging on to life in the middle of the immense destruction, all looking fatigued and emaciated. Another dog saw dried out oceans, only occupied by the occasional corpse submerged in the few puddles that remained, searching for half-rotten fish and other dead animals it could feed off of. And then, against all odds, one found the half-burned remains of their former owner. 
and we could recognize her face as one of the volunteers, twisted in an everlasting expression of agony and confusion. Whatever she had seen, or would see in the future, would remain a mystery. We ended the experiment there. Those lucky animals who had pleasant dreams were recorded and given to the owners. The rest were discarded, locked away on a hard drive to be kept hidden, and we apologized to the volunteers under the pretense that our equipment simply didn't find anything. Let's just say machine malfunction is a popular excuse in the science community when they find something they don't want you to know. Following the dreadfully successful experiment, we handed the recordings and device over to more appropriate scientific groups. Whether we discovered something about our near future or not, we needed people with better resources to deal with it. A group called Artifacts quickly swooped in and took all of our equipment, with the exception of the first prototype, which I'd brought home to calibrate months before the ordeal. I decided I would check Robbie's dreams one last time before scrapping the device, hoping to find just another pleasant one I could keep as a memory. Away from my colleagues and the stressful setting of our lab, I fed him and he fell asleep in my lap, wearing the Dreamweaver. Just like before, I was presented with another post-apocalyptic world. As the hellscape came into view, Robbie frantically sniffed his way through several partially collapsed streets. He squeezed himself through a crack in the wall, entering a well-lived-in building, one that had since been abandoned, filled with empty cans of food and water bottles. In the corner, by the entrance, lay a man trapped under a slab of concrete. His lower body had been absolutely crushed, but he hadn't bled out as the pressure kept him alive and breathing. <laughs> hey, boy, the man uttered in a weak voice followed by unintelligible human sounds Robbie couldn't understand. He recognized the voice and immediately spurted over to the slowly dying man. In shock, I realized that the broken man was myself on the brink of death. Robbie, how did you find me? I asked as I lifted my hand onto his head. He bit onto my sleeve and tried to pull me out from under the debris, not realizing that in only minutes I'd be dead. He whimpered as he heard me groan in pain. And despite his lack of understanding of death, he could tell I was suffering. Without any other options, he simply sat by my side as the city before us kept burning, keeping me company during my final hour. I kept petting him until I drew my final breath. But he remained by my side, even as I turned to little more than a limp pile of flesh, rid of any mind or soul. Then he awoke in a panic, one that immediately softened as he found himself lying in my lap, back to safety, realizing it had all been just a dream, a dream of a future yet to happen, whenever and however, you know, dogs only live so long. They know our future, but don't realize it. They just remain in our lives, the most loyal creatures in existence. You know, even as the world around them collapses, they try their absolute best to keep us safe because they love us. I hope this future can be avoided, but you know, if not, I know that when my time comes, at least I won't be alone. The stink of cigarettes and stale beer enveloped me as I pushed through the door of the last call. George Jones crooned from the jukebox and across the crowded room, Sherry Carter balanced a tray of drinks. She weaved between tables, her red hair like a flame under the cloud of tobacco smoke. We'd gone out twice since I moved back, and I hoped there might be something there. 
When Sherry turned back to the bar, I waved. She lifted her chin and smiled, dimples creasing the corners of her mouth. I blushed like a teenager. Downey! Downey Woodson! As I live and breathe! The man calling me wore a faded ball cap with a Confederate flag on the front. His smile revealed the black gap of missing teeth. My memory clicked in and I recognized Guy Lewis. I hadn't seen him since high school. The same age as me, Guy could have passed for 50. Guy waved me over. The man sitting beside him nodded. Another schoolmate, Wayne Hatch. I didn't have to guess at his name. It was embroidered in yellow thread on the pocket of his oil-stained uniform shirt. Wayne had been somebody in high school, football player, homecoming king. After he graduated, I enrolled in community college in Atlanta, and Wayne enlisted and went to Iraq. Now here he was, working at Jiffy Lube. I had a moment of satisfaction seeing that, remembering how he had let me hang around his little clique back then, like he was doing me a favor. Hey, college boy. You come home to see how the other half lives? Wayne flicked a line of ash from his cigarette and stuck out his hand. It's not like that. I shook his hand, wondering if he had read my mind. Maybe I got homesick. Missed those boiled peanuts. Well, hell, let me buy you a beer. Wayne pulled me over to the bar. He motioned Guy over, and I took the stool between them. What are you doing these days? The two men grinned. I shrugged. Nothing much. Helping the old man in his welding shop. Hard to find work lately. The manufacturing plant where I had worked for ten years folded, outdone by Chinese imports. My marriage went under at the same time as my job. My ex-wife kept the house, and I crawled back home to Jays Creek, Georgia, just until I could get back on my feet. Mom had turned my old bedroom into a craft room. I slept on the swayback twin bed I'd had in high school, pushed against the wall next to my mother's sewing machine. One drink led to another three. The clock edged close to midnight when we wandered over to the beer-stained pool table. You always were a stand-up guy. Wayne clinked his bottle against mine. Whatever happened to that old Chevy you had? He rubbed the cube of blue chalk across the tip of his pool cue. Sold it. I leaned over the pool table and made my shot. I hadn't been a jock like Guy and Wayne, and I wasn't smart enough to blend in with the college prep kids. My most redeeming feature had been that I owned a car roomy enough to fit four passengers. In high school, I'd been the one tapped to drive them across the state line so Wayne could buy beer with a fake ID. Wayne made the final shot right before the bar closed, hitting the eight ball with a clack. It dropped into the corner pocket. You working at your old man's shop? He got a portable cutting torch? Well, yeah. Most of our work is in shop, though. Why? I tilted my bottle and drank the last lukewarm swallow. Let's go for a drive. I hung my cue on the rack and we strolled outside. Before we reached Wayne's truck, the neon sign above the bar flickered out, leaving the lot in darkness. I hesitated, torn between curiosity and a desire to go home and sleep off the buzz. Guy waved me on. He opened the door of Wayne's truck and fished a pint of wild turkey bourbon from under the seat. Guy twisted the cap and handed it over. What the hell? I took the bottle and choked down a drink. The whiskey jolting me awake one instant, then settling in my stomach like a warm coal. Wayne gripped my arm and leaned close to my face. His bloodshot, watery eyes stared into mine. I'm gonna show you something that will change your life. At that point, I could have said no thanks, climbed into my car, and gone home to sleep in that twin bed, springs poking up into my back. Instead... I went along with them just like I'd done in high school, like the past 15 years hadn't happened. We piled into Wayne's 20-year-old Ford pickup, me in the middle with my leg pressed up against the shifter. The truck motor rumbled back to life, and with a crunch of gravel, we were on the road. I figured we'd end up either at a steel in the middle of the woods or a trailer home meth lab. 
The truck swayed around curves, rocking on worn out shocks. The hum of the motor, the road heat rising through the floorboards, coupled with the buzz from the whiskey, lulled me into a half waking, half dreaming state. I jolted awake when the truck stopped. Guy elbowed me. Time to rise and shine. Where are we? I rubbed my eyes and squinted at the rutted path lit by the Ford's headlights. The front bumper rested before a rusty cattle gate. Guy hopped out. I shook my head, trying to bring the unfamiliar landscape into focus. Wayne flipped off the truck's headlights as Guy unlocked the padlock chain wound through the bars. We drove through and Guy closed the creaking gate behind us. Waist-high weeds hid the edges of the drive. The truck bounced down the track in the dark, lit only by the moon overhead. At last, Wayne eased the truck to a stop in front of a sagging wood frame house. Weeds sprung up between the missing boards of the porch. We walk from here. Wayne stepped from the truck. He reached into a cooler in the truck bed and brought out three brown bottles dripping from melted ice. We hiked along a dirt path cut through tall Johnson grass that slashed at our jeans toward a thick line of brush and trees. Wayne led the way down a single track, barely visible in the moonlight. Guy fell in behind me, and the three of us stumbled through the woods. We emerged in the clearing, bisected by rusted train tracks and overrun by weeds. Right here. Wayne twisted the top from one of the bottles he held. He flung the cap at the tracks, then handed me the bottle. Beer foamed over the top, the cold liquid spilling onto my hand. We found it a couple months back, Guy began, then stopped when Wayne frowned at him. Less you know the better, Wayne said. I laughed, a nervous sound in the dark. But we ain't about to get arrested for trespassing, are we? Nah, that's my aunt's place back there, Guy said. She lives out here all by herself? I pointed my beer bottle towards the dark silhouette of the house. She ain't around no more. Guy tossed an arm across my shoulders and led me into the middle of the track. Check this out. We stood between the rails. I scuffed a boot across bits of rotted wood. Guy bounced on his feet, humming. Showtime. Wayne stiffened and turned towards us. A dim yellow light floated behind his head. The ground trembled under my feet, as though something huge and monstrous approached. The light grew closer and brighter. The clatter of a locomotive sounded. Guy jumped from the track laughing. I stumbled backward. My foot caught the edge of the rail and I fell to my knees. I looked up, blinded by the light from the train. A whistle sounded impossibly loud. I scrambled to my feet as Wayne grabbed the collar of my shirt, yanking me to safety. And then the locomotive was upon us. Steam billowed from the stack. The great black cow catcher on the front sweeping down the gleaming rails. Hot air rushed past, mixed with the stink of burning coal and metal. I stared, frozen in place less than five feet from the train. Wayne still gripped my collar as I bent into the rush of hot air from the locomotive. It couldn't be real. Like someone standing at the edge of a cliff and longing to jump, I swayed towards the train. Wayne jerked me back. Trembling, I drained my beer and chucked the bottle at the last car, expecting it to pass through the train as though through a cloud. Instead, the bottle exploded against the metal wheels, the clink of breaking glass all but overpowered by the thunder of the wheels. A face, pale and round, with dead black holes for eyes pressed against the window. Hi, damn! Guy whooped and chucked his bottle. It spun through the train and disappeared into the grass on the other side of the tracks. The train rolled along, the image of it flickering like a broken movie reel, and faded to nothing as it left the clearing. I spun and punched the guy. He staggered back, clutching his jaw. Why'd you do that? Was that real? It could have killed me. Guy stooped and picked up a chunk of wet glass. As real as it gets, bro. You feel it? <laughs> yeah, it could have punched your ticket. Civil War ghost train. 
Wayne scuffed the boot at the weeds choking the rusted rails. It's the Andersonville train, carrying gold to pay the Confederate soldiers. Guess no one told them the war ended. Guy threw back his head and howled a rebel yell, his voice warbling and rising. Well, you're talking about that old legend? Everyone in Jay's Creek knew the story. Somewhere near our little town, a Confederate train had crashed, leaving behind a rumor of lost gold. Hell, I'd search for it myself as a kid, scouring the fields filled with brambles and earning nothing but sunburn and poison ivy for my trouble. That train never made it past this valley. No one knows what happened to the gold. There's some sort of doorway here. The train gets solid the closer we get to the full moon. When it passes that curve, it fades until you can't see it anymore. Wayne pointed down the track, where broken rails bent and rose to curve around the hill. This here is the only spot she's real. My head spun. How is that thing here? I gestured toward the rusted tracks. How did you find it? Wayne shook his head. The only thing that matters is she's real. He grinned and slung his arm around me, pulling me close. Hot beer-scented breath brushed my ear. Because tomorrow night's the full moon, and we're going to rob that train. It's not love of money at the root of evil. It's the lack of it that causes the hurt. I lied to my old man that morning, skipped work and told him I wasn't feeling well, when the only thing wrong with me was too much alcohol the night before. Now here I was waiting in a dark parking lot for two men who'd barely tolerated me in high school and were using me now like they used me back then. I couldn't get the night before out of my mind. According to the stories I found on the internet, the Andersonville train had been carrying Union prisoners when it derailed somewhere east of Jay's Creek. The closest estimates on the websites put the missing gold at over a million dollars in current value. That much money would get me out of Mom's sewing room. I leaned against my car's cooling hood. I was parked at the edge of the lot at the last call, far away from the blue and green glow of the neon lights. I placed a backpack with the portable cutting torch at my feet. Like Wayne had ordered, I wore black jeans and a solid black t-shirt. My coat, a long duster, reached to my ankles. I added a black knit cap snug around my ears. While I waited, I dug an antacid from the roll stashed in my car's glove box. The chalky peppermint taste did little to settle my stomach. I'd half hoped they wouldn't show when the headlights from Wayne's truck split the night. The moment it rolled to a stop, Guy threw open the truck door, leaned out, and called me over. He had a rifle cradled on his lap. That's some massive firepower. I paused, half in and half out of the truck. Is that an AR? Guy laughed. <laughs> what? You think we're gonna rob a train with a pocket knife? Stash your gear and get in. We need to be moving. Wayne shifted in his seat, revealing the handle of a black pistol stuck in a holster on his hip. Do I get a gun? I asked. Only thing you need is that torch, Wayne answered. I stepped onto the running board and checked the gas levels on the oxy and acetylene tanks for the hundredth time. Before I pushed everything under the toolbox, I hesitated, then pulled the heavy pry bar out of the backpack and stashed it in the deep inner pocket of my coat. Satisfied, I shoved the pack next to a green plastic lantern case. Wayne and Guy both wore gray wool coats and pants. They looked straight out of a Civil War reenactment. Wayne steered the truck down moonlit roads. I tried to recognize our route to remember the way we went this time. In the dark, most of those one-lane country roads looked the same. When we got to the gate, Guy handed me the padlock key and nudged me to jump out. I fumbled with the lock until it released and the clasp fell open. We bounced along the track from the night before and stopped at the abandoned house. The front door hung open on broken hinges. A stack of yellowing newspaper fluttered on the porch. Guy had said his aunt wasn't around anymore. I didn't think she'd be coming back. We climbed out of the truck, Guy whistling Dixie until Wayne snapped at him. Shut up! 
No sense telling the whole county where we are. I grabbed the backpack with the torch while Wayne lit the lantern. He rose, holding the light up and inspecting the flame. What if the train doesn't stop? Images flooded my head. Guy and Wayne sucked into the path of the locomotive and ground to meat under the metal wheels. If it doesn't, no loss to you. We'll be the ones taking the risk. Guy grinned. That train runs us over, and you just gotta scurry on back to your mama's. Cut the shit and let's go. Wayne struck off along the narrow path to the tracks. At the clearing, Wayne motioned me toward a stand of brush. You wait here. Hunker down so they don't see you until the train stops. Then come up behind us. I crouched there in the dark, hidden behind the glossy leaves of a mountain laurel. The full moon lit the space in cool white light. My backpack rested against my leg and I kept one hand on the strap, ready to rush out as soon as the train rolled to a stop. If it stopped. The image of that dead face I'd seen in the window the night before flashed through my mind. Fifteen feet in front of me, Wayne and Guy waited beside the track. Guy with his rifle slung over his shoulder and Wayne gripping the lantern. In the circle of yellow light, the two of them looked gaunt and worn down, like they had just stepped off a battlefield. Black smears of dirt and oil dotted their gray wool pants and coats. Beard stubble shadowed Wayne's face and Guy's brow was hidden under a crushed gray cap. Wayne wore the leather satchel slung over his shoulder. Right at midnight, a train whistle sounded, low and mournful. I straightened and shrugged on the backpack. Wayne lifted the lantern and swung it back and forth as they stepped onto the track. Behind them, I held my breath as the train appeared. The locomotive's headlight was a great yellow eye above the sweep of the cow catcher. I looked away, afraid to watch. A wrenching squeal sounded as the metal wheels ground against the rails and slowed, stopping less than a yard from Wayne and Guy. The train waited, smoke rising from its stack. I studied the dark windows on the train cars, hoping I wouldn't spot a face peering out. Careful to stay outside the circle of light cast by Wayne's lantern, I shuffled forward. With a creak, the door to the cab car behind the engine swung open and a lone soldier stepped out. His bony wrist hung down past the frayed edges of his gray uniform shirt. The cuffs of his gray trousers were rolled up over his boots. Flaking mud covered both pants and boots. Faint blonde hair dotted his pale cheeks. He looked no older than a teenager. Too young for the rifle slung across his chest. The boy stared out into the distance. Wayne lowered the lantern and greeted him. Permission to board? We've come from Atlanta with a message for your commanding officer. He slid a hand inside his shirt and pulled out the corner of an envelope. The soldier nodded and motioned us aboard. I stepped onto the train behind Wayne and Guy. The locomotive stack belched a cloud of white steam as the train shut down crouched on the tracks like a large hungry animal, a predator for sure. Before I passed through the door to the car, I glanced behind us toward the engine. The space where the engineer would ride was empty. We trudged down the passenger car's narrow aisle following our escort. I pulled my coat aside to keep it from catching on the wooden seats. Flickering lanterns hung from the post near the car's ceiling casting feeble light across the soldiers slumped across the benches. A foul odor filled the space, the stink of piss, shit, and rotten meat. More than half the soldiers were dressed in Union blue. Chains circled their ankles. In all the talk of missing gold, I never pictured what a prison train would be like. Almost all the men, Confederate and Union both, had blood-stained bandages wrapped around some part of their body. Their vacant stares met mine until I dropped my gaze to the scarred wooden boards under our feet. We passed through that car and into the silent open air. Gone were the usual night sounds, the chirp of crickets, the whistle and call of night birds, the humph of bullfrogs. 
The soldier ushered us through another car, filled with prisoners, and out again to the third car on the train. The soldier halted at the entrance to the last car and told us to wait. When he came out, he nodded to us and held the door while we tromped through. Wayne swung his head around and grinned at me. Showtime, he whispered. At ease, Lieutenant. The officer speaking rose from behind a small table. A rough salt and pepper beard covered the bottom half of the man's face. He braced his arms against the tabletop and pushed aside the map he had been studying. His hands were red and chapped and scabs dotted the knuckles. Our escort took up a position with his back to the door we had just walked through. He shifted his weight and leaned against the door frame and kept both hands on the rifle. I glanced around the cramped car. The officer's desk was to our right. A folded berth hung closed against the wall above it. At the end of the space was a wash basin with a mirror above. On our left, partly hidden beside a storage closet, I spied the safe. You have a communication for me? The officer held out his hand. We do indeed, Wayne answered. He reached into his coat. Instead of a letter, he drew out his pistol and shot the officer. <laughs> then spun and shot the young soldier too. The soldier left a thick trail of crimson as he slid down the wall. His rifle clattered to the floor. I stared at the stripe of blood, wondering how the dead could be killed again. The officer collapsed into the chair, one arm flung out, palm up, as though pleading with us. Blood ran from the black hole in his chest. He wheezed a sucking breath and raised a hand to point at us. <laughs> you go to hell. Wayne lifted the pistol and shot the man between the eyes. Bits of bone and brain splattered against the train car wall behind him. The dead officer fell forward across the map spread out over the table. I clasped my stomach and bent over, gasping. No. No. No time for that shit. Guy nudged me with his rifle. You got a job to do. My ears rang from the gunfire, but I got his message. Shaken, I knelt in front of the safe and hooked up the tanks to the torch. The metallic sulfur stink of the gunpowder hung in the air. I coughed. Won't someone come running after hearing those shots? You worry about opening that safe. Wayne stood over me, the pistol against his leg. Guy stepped over the dead soldier and trotted out the door. I turned my back on Wayne and studied the safe, wrapping the metal side with my knuckles. It was squat and black, with an ornate gilded plate on the front. Cast iron, most likely, just as my web research had mentioned. I lit the torch. The flame's hiss sounded as though it were underwater. I knelt and touched the steady blue fire to the side of the safe and began to cut. My world narrowed to the job at hand. Sparks like fireworks sprang from the path of the cutting torch. Cast iron doesn't cut easily. I moved the torch in an arc, heating the metal until gradually a gap began to form where the flame scored the side. My hearing returned enough that over the noise of the torch I heard the rapid pop of gunfire. I flinched with each shot, but I held the cutting flame steady. I couldn't help but picture those soldiers chained to the benches in the cars ahead. The knowledge that they had been dead for over a century did little to justify the massacre. Guy burst through the door as I made the last sweep with the torch. I switched off the gas. All clear? Wayne nodded towards the door. Guy sucked in a breath. Hell yeah! I rained down on them like judgment day! A line of red traced down his brow and across the side of his face. I hoped one of the soldiers had gotten in a blow or a shot. What are you waiting for? Wayne motioned with the pistol. Crack her open! It's too hot to touch! I knelt beside the safe and held my hand over the side. The metal radiated heat. I reached for the pry bar in my coat pocket when a pistol shot rang out. Guy's body hit the floor next to me. His dead eyes bulged from the pressure of the bullet that took out a good chunk of his brain. I looked up into the barrel of Wayne's gun. My fingers wrapped around the pry bar. I rose, swinging the heavy bar at Wayne. Ah! It made contact with his wrist as he pulled the trigger. 
I felt the crunch of bone through the bar. The bullet scored a hot trail across my upper arm. Wayne dropped the gun and I kicked it spinning across the floor. It whirled to a stop next to the dead soldier's thigh. I raised the bar again. Stay back! What the fuck, Wayne? He gripped his broken wrist, then lunged toward the gun. I swung the pry bar again, this time catching him on the back of his head. <coughs> Wayne collapsed, moaning. He rolled over and swung his good arm at me. I brought the bar down on his knee. Wayne screamed. I scooped up the gun. For good measure, I grabbed Guy's rifle and the dead soldier's weapon, stashing them behind me. I held the gun on Wayne. He sat up, blood running from the wound on his head. Tears streamed down his face. You think this is it? You just gonna walk off this train with the gold? Wayne spat on the floor. Hell, I should have had Guy shoot you as soon as he came back in. He wanted to. You know, there never was going to be a three-way split. And not a two-way either, huh? Wayne slumped against the wall, the soldier's corpse on one side, Guy's body sprawled on the other. Satisfied Wayne wasn't going anywhere, I pocketed the gun and turned to the safe. I wedged the pry bar into the gap I'd cut in the side and threw my weight against it. The safe gave way with a squeal of metal and the portion I'd cut dropped off. The sides of the holes were still hot, so I knelt and used the pry bar to rake the contents out. Bits of charred paper money fluttered from the safe. The heat from the torch had lit a fire inside the safe. A handful of coins followed, spilling from a burnt cloth sack. No gold. Ignoring the heat, I reached in and swept the bottom of the safe with my hand. Nothing. I clutched one of the coins, then threw it at Wayne. Here's your treasure. Wayne picked up the coin and studied it. <laughs> it's not even real money. This here is a token. <laughs> he choked out a terrible laugh that ended in a scream. I rose from the floor, intent on grabbing my gear and leaving the train when I felt a shudder under my feet. The train was moving. Hey! Wayne reached out a hand. Don't leave me! A gurgle issued from the dead officer, slumped over the map table. He rose like a puppet pulled by strings, until he sat up once more in his chair. His wounds closed with sucking sounds. Transfixed, I didn't realize the soldier until he clutched one of my legs. Ah! I kicked at the corpse. Wayne dragged himself toward the door at the front of the car. The train picked up speed. Outside the car's window, I spied dark trees moving past in slow motion. I swung the backpack, waited with the metal gas cylinders, and hit the soldier. His jaw flapped sideways, broken, and he let me go. I leapt for the door at the rear of the car. Horrible noises filled the train car. Wayne screaming and shuffling, scrabbling noises. Just before I flung the door open and jumped from the moving locomotive, I glanced in the mirror above the wash basin. What I saw made me freeze for an instant. Guy sitting up and reaching for Wayne. I made my way back through the woods to where Wayne had parked his truck by the empty house. He had left the keys in the ignition. I drove back to the last call and wiped my prints from the truck. I went home and lay awake on my twin bed. After a few days, Wayne's folks reported him missing, and there was a search for him and Guy. Nothing ever came of it. A month went by before I went back to the train in time for the full moon. I waited through most of the night, but nothing ever came. They'd gotten what they needed from us, I figure, and moved on to wherever restless spirits go. I took something from that train, though. The cloth of sack coins. Tokens, just like Wayne said. Turned out they were valuable after all. Not as much as gold, but still enough to put a down payment on the land where Guy's aunt had lived. 
It went up for auction for unpaid taxes shortly after I sold the coins. I'll tear down the house and build a new one for Sherry and me. Some nights, when the moon is full, I'll venture down to the tracks and wait. I'll wait to see if that locomotive passes by, and a familiar face with dead eyes stares from the window. suitcase in hands, you head to the station. There is no way in hell that you are going to forgive that lying, cheating bastard ever again. He can't be trusted anymore, and you know it. You know his lies about working late nights, the smell of that stinking fucking bourbon on his breath when he crawls into your bed at 3 a.m., his wanting even more sexual gratification, even though you can smell the scent of his extracurricular whores he's been lying with. You ask the same questions over and over, and his answers never make a grade of believability. You want real answers, not quick bullshit defenses. Is that her lipstick on your clothes? Do you ask whose blonde hair is that you just pulled from his collar? His answers are always lies and you know it. Why are you drunk and where is all this money from the overtime hours you're putting in? You ask him, <laughs> but you already know his expected lies. You're not stupid, are you? Are you going to be his fool again? Dig a fucking hole in the woods to stash his cheating carcass after you chop him into pieces. You know it doesn't need to be a big hole. He's such a little man with a shriveled scrubby worm. You know I'll help you. You know I'm tired of preaching this crap over and over when you refuse to follow through with anything but allowing the prick to continue his game. Why am I wasting my time inside your pathetic arduous mind? Are you willing to continue being his pawn? Why are you sitting there just looking at the situation blankly? Do you need him to give you physical scars to match the years of the mental ones he's given you? Grow some balls. You're nothing but his damn housekeeper. Do you love cooking and cleaning for a worthless piece of crap that does nothing but use you? while bedding down any other tramp he can fleece out of her panties? Are you waiting for him to give you a biological gift that keeps giving? Maybe herpes or the clap? You know me. You know who you do. You've had me as your friend since the day you were born. My voice and instincts are the ones you've sought comfort in every time that hack fucks you over. You need to be watched and prodded, or you'll fall into every goddamn trap he has set for you. Don't you dare be weak or naive. Fucking kittens are weak. Hamsters are weak. Be a pit bull, for God's sake. Use the balls you have that are bigger than the BBs he's sporting. You know, your pedantics are tiring, don't you? You don't need any more specifics. You know, my patience is near lost with you. You know who wants to be here to support you. But how long can you expect me to sit here and watch this predictable script you play? You're tiring. You are pushing my limits. Are you done listening to his fabrications about why he is going out of town? Why he isn't available for your calls when he's on those weekend trips? You know the type of woman who he's with when he isn't with you. You could pick her out of a lineup in a New York minute. Young, vivacious, and dumber than a bag of dog shit. All boobs and no brains. Wake the hell up while you still hold any value for someone else. Leave him. Who knows how you haven't stuck a knife in his chest or sweetened his drinks with antifreeze already? If it were up to me, 
he'd already be a burn spot on the river's edge. What are you waiting for? For him to bring some bitch home to live in the basement? So he only has to travel down a stairway instead of on a plane train or auto to dip his wick? All while you're upstairs reading a fucking romance novel. You're pathetic. Maybe you deserve each other. But you're on to his deceptions. You know what he is capable of by now. You know at the very least what you need to do. Conceive it, plan it, purchase what you require to get the job done, and fucking implement it already. You're at your last straw. Your wits end. Your cup is about to overflow. And it's not with your joy. You have your alibi. You needn't have that worry. Don't you lie to yourself. You've been thinking this for years. You've been planning how to make him pay. You feel the hate growing rampant inside your heart. You just need to cut the vine, damn it. You ache from the burn he's brought you with his sanctimonious line of shit. How it's always your fault for not being supportive like you promised on that wedding day. That was the day that brought this pile of excrement and carnage into your life. Drunk on promises to be broken just around the corner. Bullshit. You should make him pay. You should charge interest. And you should demand repayment with his blood. You should make it excruciatingly painful. Make him suffer as you have suffered for all these years. But tenfold. You don't want to just leave him, do you? You need more than that. Why should you let him off the hook so easy? Are you going to just sneak out like a broken-spirited puppy and leave the perpetrator of all the crimes with the loot, the house, the car? Are you going to give him your last shred of pride? Why wouldn't you instead come up with a plan that leaves him suffering while you make your getaway? Or maybe you should watch his last gasp for air before you fill his mouth with more water so that you can watch his fat face turn beet red before turning a pale blue as he gasps and chokes. His eyes bulging out of their sockets in anguish. You can come up with a way. You're smart that way. You've done this before, haven't you? This surely isn't your first rodeo, is it? Do you need me to prod you on to defend your honor and kill the bastard that's ripping your heart out piece by piece? He holds it up for all of his drinking buddies to see and laughs at your expense while he guzzles another cheap glass of house whiskey. You need to be brave. You've been resilient to a fault. A ball can only bounce back so many times before it rolls out into the highway, horribly meeting its end flattened and dumped by the curb, a forgotten clump of rotting trash. You don't want to be that ball. You don't deserve that. You're still young enough and attractive. Don't be his seconds and thirds. I'll be there inside your head. You won't be alone. I'll be your director and your alibi when you've finished your mission. Be strong. So it's poison you've decided? It's slow and sweet, but you won't get the satisfaction of that bastard twisting and gurgling. He won't know your reasons why, unless he feels your pain through his. I want you to take the ice pick with you, just for the final act. I want you to be able to enjoy the questioning of why he's hurt you. His fear will spill out of his eyes as he looks at you, while you stab tiny round holes in his vacant heart. I want you to witness the fear fade into his slow death of forced, heaving, gasping, sucking sounds while he fights with everything he stole from you for his last breath. Praying it comes quick. I want you to smile at his pain and laugh as he begs you for help, just to kill him and give him that final relief from agonizing strain as his body slowly shuts down. Even if you get caught, you've won the race. 
but you won't be discovered. You've planned. You've mapped it out. You've dotted your I's and crossed your T's. You've cleaned your tracks and shown no one your inner disgust for him. You're the grieving widow, the victim, the crushed and lonely lady who doesn't know what to do without him. You're a fucking genius. Other than taking too long to realize it, all of those wasted conversations and attempts at repairing him, well, you can't fix being taken for granted and used like a throwaway call girl. Those times you let him enter inside you, even though you fought the urge to vomit while his sweat dripped and slid over your body. You can be an actress. You've done it for years. You can make anyone believe your performance. You can use the rage built up because you've flipped the release valve by letting off steam at the perfect time. Your pressure bled off, and now there is nothing left but tears of sorrow. Boo frickin' who. The cops will lick the grief from the palms of your hands like a puppy lapping up ice cream. What? Seriously? You finally did your job, and I congratulate you. Well goddamn done and bravo. Mission complete. All but for the bidding farewell as that worthless fuck's casket lowers into the ground for one last sweet ass goodbye. I'm proud of you, girl. You got off your lazy bum and staked your claim. The poison was a choice for the meek. But at least you followed through. It did look like shit there at the last. All shriveled and sunken in. I hope you took a snapshot for memory's sake. Something to hang over the fireplace mantle. I myself would have chosen the ice pick or maybe a hammer. Something with gusto that would color the room red. But I seem to have a little more rage inside. You've always been the humane one. The pleaser. Take your last look at the pews. Count the whores that sit in the back rows in the shadows, barely old enough to drive here on their own without their mommies, each wondering who the other was to him. Which slut was the first to be his second to you, and so on. You had his best before he was another's sloppy seconds. You win. You get the house, the car, the insurance money. You get it all. But most of all, you get the satisfaction of knowing it was all by your wit and tenacity. You get back your dignity, and that's golden. And now, my lovely, with suitcase in one hand... I want you to head to that station with a one-way ticket in your other hand, mentally say good fucking riddance to him as you board that train to a new life. You can ride off into the sunset knowing you've done an A-plus fine fucking job. You've succeeded the valedictorian of the perfect homicide. But best of all, now you can call him. Let him know you finally did it. No more sneaking him out the back door when the piece of shit husband crawls in drunk again. You've checked him out, right? He's got money. He's not bad looking and you know he's a porn star in bed. I think he may even have a weak heart. But I guess you knew that all along. Sebastian Wolf came home to the familiar whine of his dogs after another long day at work. They always acted like they hadn't seen him in ages. He held his hands out to them, which they showered in kisses. Easy, easy, he told them, as they tried to push past his hands and get into his face. Sebastian was debating if it was a drinking night or not. He had to work the next day, and it was only Tuesday, but some days the bottle called louder than others and wouldn't be ignored. A jogger in gray trainers came down the sidewalk. 
Once upon a time, Sebastian would try waving and bidding the stranger a good evening. It barely occurred to him anymore. Living among the English had proven to be like living in a desert compared to where he had come from. His heritage was rooted in two cultures that were very social by tradition, Argentinian and Chilean. A few career decisions and unforeseen life events later, he ended up in Sussex, England, where faces didn't smile, eyes didn't meet, laughter was dry and sarcastic, and the obituaries may as well have been the funnies. This hadn't been easy for Sebastian. Back where he was from, no matter how the day went, you at least had the warmth of family and good neighbors. Sebastian was perpetually alone in Sussex. He was an army of one in the workplace, and he had no one to knock back a drink with at the end of the day. He could tell his dogs anything he wanted to, but... You know. At least he didn't have to be lonely in squalor. The flat he rented was rather posh, as his neighbors would say, if they would say anything to him at all. He studied himself in an ivory-rimmed bathroom mirror. His five o'clock shadow wasn't as dark as it used to be in certain places. Gray was peppered abundantly along his chin. He almost thought that some of the color in his eyes had faded, if brown could fade. Forty-one, he muttered to himself. He could remember looking in the mirror and saying things like twenty-five and thirty. Those moments felt like forever ago. The bottle won. He poured an expensive whiskey into a tumbler that looked like it had been cut like a gemstone. He sat out on his rooftop deck and would watch to see if the dying daylight would make a sunset worth seeing. He was rewarded. The sky was painted fiery colors, and seagulls piped and drifted among the houses, looking for handouts. Sebastian eyed the old ladies and others that came onto their own rooftop to feed the scavenging gulls. They could socialize with the birds, but not with each other, he noted. Had Sussex been any of the number of places he had lived with his parents? The rooftops would have been crowded with smiling, jovial people, draining the whiskey bottle dry and laughing so loudly that the seagulls would be frightened away. But not here. People occupied their own personal spaces that nobody left and nobody visited. Before long, Sebastian began to notice that someone was observing him. Not just once, but several times, spanning several evenings. He was sharp of eyes, unlike most people he ran into. He partially questioned why this turn of neighborly behavior bothered him. He had been distantly hoping for some level of interaction with others, but perhaps this was too forward without a proper introduction. Still... The man with the small mustache and the sloppy comb-over stood in front of Sebastian's yard, just beyond his turf, and stared. The days that this occurred became weeks. One evening, Sebastian had enough. His observer hadn't missed a day for two weeks straight, and it was time for an introduction before he decided to either ask the man out for a drink or strike him across the jaw and stomp his head into the pavement. His visitor seemed wary, and perhaps even a bit surprised to see Sebastian approach him. "'Can I help you?' Sebastian said, clad in a burgundy bathrobe with slippers to match. "'You acknowledge my presence,' the man stated, a thick German accent carrying the words. This prompted Sebastian to smile and nod. Oh, "'No wonder you're not like everyone else. You're not a tea-sucking, crumpet-shitting local.' Sebastian remarked, a bit under the influence. This made the stranger smirk. Oh, no wonder you're always alone. You're not tainted, he said. The words didn't even register in Sebastian's senses. His brain felt like it was getting a breath of fresh air with someone to actually talk to. Care for a drink? Gladly, the stranger said. And just like that, in a dry desert of fellowship and social fulfillment, the two men found an oasis in the other's company. They knew nothing about each other, but they sat back on Sebastian's patio furniture on his rooftop and talked and laughed as the clouds turned pink and the horizon turned gold. 
As the amber whiskey flowed, both men volunteered more information about themselves. Sebastian spoke of the way he meandered from his homeland to Sussex, where he hated to be but never quite got up the gumption to make concrete plans to leave, and he wasn't sure why. Anton told a very outlandish tale of growing up in an orphanage in Austria, where his classmates exiled him for being the hidden son of Adolf Hitler. He didn't really know if that's who he was. It was just the license that the other kids used to either alienate him or brutalize him. Amidst so many beatings, he would protest, You're not respectful of my rights! To which his assailants would respond, We are not Adolf Hitler's son! He thus found himself where he was, 46 years old and perfectly isolated from society as he knew it, until that very moment where he was having a blast with his fellow alcoholic. The morning found both men sleeping in late and hung over. Sebastian could now look at his visitor's face for the first time with focused eyes. It wasn't a far-fetched notion that he was the progeny of the late Fuhrer. If the mustache had been chopped an inch on either side, he would look just like his supposed father. But what were the odds, really? Sebastian made a mediocre breakfast of scrambled eggs, toast, and coffee, and extended the absurd social engagement with the stranger claiming to be a war criminal's son. So, what brings the son of Hitler to a gaping vat of anus like Sussex? Sebastian asked while shoveling eggs into his mouth. Uh, hiding, mostly. My father was not a likable man, so I do not want to merely waltz back into my homeland announcing who he was. But if I go back home as a stranger, life would be a challenge. So I remain where I am, where my roots run deep enough to keep me alive. Sebastian poured some whiskey in his coffee. He held it up and shook the bottle, raising his eyebrows. Well, of course, Anton said with flourish. The truth potion filled both men again until Anton got up and stumbled over his leather bag. He drew out a stethoscope, an exceptionally well-made one. He pressed the end of it to Sebastian's chest and smiled as he heard a healthy, steady tick in his chest. Mr. Wolf, I will show you some things that will blow your understanding of the world. Before I do that, I need you to listen to my heart. Sebastian was just a few sips away from cross-eyed status again when he agreed. The world went quiet as the stethoscope plugged his ears. The business end rested against Anton's chest, and his heart announced its presence loud and clear. Anton took the device back and beckoned. Follow me. The two men bumbled their way onto the sidewalk where the occasional pedestrian wandered by. Anton fearlessly seized the first one he saw, a man of about sixty years of age out for a jog. My friend, would you be a peach and let me listen to your heartbeat? Anton said rather mushily. The frowning Englishman looked Anton up and down but didn't see any reason to object. Anton put the diaphragm of the stethoscope against the stranger's chest and smiled. He leered at Sebastian. Have a listen, no? He said, holding out the headset. Sebastian fumbled the ear tips until he had them in and he waited. And waited. And waited. Anton, I don't hear anything, he said. Anton just smiled. The stranger's eyes rapidly ticked back and forth between the two drunks. Thank you for your time, sir, Anton said to the jogger, dismissing him. Sebastian was sobering up just enough to think critically. What the hell was that? I didn't hear anything at all. That's the point, Anton replied rather smugly. Your neighbors behave heartlessly, for that is exactly what they are. Sebastian and Anton slept most of the afternoon and the evening. Sebastian was plagued by strange dreams of being in public. The grocery store, the gas station, the park. All places populated by people that had gaping black voids in their chests. Black holes that were perfect pits of silence and absence. Heartless. Soulless. 
They drank tea through their mouths only for the hot liquid to spill out of their chests and eat holes in the floor or dissolve the flowers and grass on the ground. Sebastian was the first one to wake up. It was almost dark outside. He felt like he could sleep another twelve hours. He first made sure his guest was all right. The spitting image of Hitler was snuggling up to a long pillow on the couch and snoring. He was all right. Sebastian looked at him for a long moment. The two men had exchanged many secrets and much personal information, but had been too soggy to absorb all of it. They might as well have been alone and talking to themselves. Be that as it may, Sebastian was happy to have Anton's company. His thoughts were interrupted by the sounds of struggling coming from the front lawn. Sebastian came outside in time to see his dogs ganging up on a stranger holding a crowbar. The dogs had been faster than the stranger, and the blunt weapon fell to the grass harmlessly. The dogs made quick work of the stranger, who bled out onto the turf when his throat was ripped out. Sebastian speechlessly approached the slain body with a steaming hole in its throat. He about wet himself when something the size of a cat wormed its way up from inside the body's chest and emerged through the wound. A squealing, squirming, clawing mockery of life. Something like an overgrown bat crossed with an inbred monkey. One of the dogs seized it and shook it until its neck snapped. The whole pack set to devouring the small monster. Sebastian fainted. I suppose it's my turn to make breakfast? Anton said with a smile. Sebastian was lying on the floor as his senses spoke to him one by one. He clutched his pounding head, unable to tell if his plight was due to alcohol or psychological trauma. My... My dogs, they... Made doggy kibble out of a foolish trespasser? Yes? Sebastian needed another drink but didn't have the heart to pour one. Jesus, Anton. Something crawled out of the body and it wasn't natural. We need to call the police. We need to notify someone. So they won't come for the dog food. They will come for you. I know their true nature, and so they follow me around. I got tipsy and I showed you their true nature. So, now they follow you around, just as they follow me. Sebastian stared at him for a long moment. Who are you? And what have you just gotten me into? I am the truth, and you are not ready for me yet, Anton said with a chuckle. But no matter. The truth came for your head, and it will do it again now that you are associated with me. Sebastian held up his hands as if that would clear his head up faster. Whoa, whoa, give it to me straight and clear. Why am I suddenly a wanted man by people with no heartbeat and little demons living in their bodies? You'll notice how the English are cold and distant, right? They have no humor, no sympathy. They have no heartbeat. They have no individual mind. I have been studying why for many years and arrived at many dead ends. When I am nearing a breakthrough, they find me and drive me away. He gestured to Sebastian. They must think you are my partner in perceived crime. For they attack you in the same way they attack me all my years, trying to help. This is crazy! Sebastian yelled. This is reality, Anton countered. Perhaps you help me find a cure. Find a release for the Englishmen, so they do not give birth to little demon babies. Uh... Yeah, sure, Sebastian said, still not sure what he was agreeing to. Now you are hunted, and you must not be out after dark if you can help it, Anton warned. Now I will need to get back to work. I must return to my home and get my computer and notes. We work quickly together. Please stay here while I get tools. Sebastian forgot about his agreement just as soon as he had made it. His mind and his body were begging for some kind of release, some kind of escape and suspension of the stress and the tension. 
He stretched in front of his home and took off a little faster than he should have for not stopping to warm up. The stress was at critical mass and threatened to explode out of him in some shape or fashion. Premature exertion was the healthiest outlet he had at the time. He felt much better sooner than he thought he would. The bird song filled his ears along with the murmur of the wind in the tree. There were still flowers in people's yards, and there were still lovely girls out for walks with their dogs, however much they may or may not have lacked a pulse. Between the change of scenery and the endorphins that were starting to flow steadily into his veins, he almost convinced himself that Anton, the English, and the silence through the stethoscope were all just a bad dream. The sun began to set, and the richness of the colors flowed through his eyes and cleansed the plaque of darkness from his soul. He had to keep running. He had to keep putting distance between himself and Anton and the reality he was trying to show him. A horrible, impossible reality that raises questions that would bring madness with the answers. He had to keep plunging into this reality of sunsets and cool, fragrant breezes. He was schooled in reality once more when a great flapping noise blew the air around him and whooshed into his ears. Something sharp ripped a huge gash into his sweatshirt. His first thought was that a crazed hawk or something had attacked him. Perhaps he was in the vicinity of a nest. He got a view of the back of the thing as it flew up and away to circle back and make another dive. It wasn't a bird. Far from it. Birds didn't have a wingspan that ridiculous. Nor did birds have arms with claws as wicked as the ones on their toes. Birds also didn't have small, round, and bald heads with glowing yellow eyes and pointed demonic ears. Birds didn't have long tails that ended in points as sharp as arrows. The creature circled back around and dove straight for Sebastian's face. If Sebastian wasn't questioning his sanity earlier, he definitely was then in that moment. The creature opened its feet like a raptor and also swiped with its hands. It raked him across his temple with three crimson lines that began bleeding ribbons of red. It stung something fierce. The pain was cold. He opened his eyes just in time to see three more creatures of similar appearance coming out of the sky to pay him a visit. He became fearful. One of those little guys might just be a nuisance, but four of them could probably tear him apart, like an attack by feral dogs with wings. He protected his face by ducking his head down between his elbows and wrapping his hands behind his head at the price of offering his back to the monsters. It offered little to no protection against every pair of serrated talons that swooped down at him. The claws were cold, and his blood flowed warm. Then a horn honked nearby, and someone yelled at him in German. It was Anton. He had driven out to find Sebastian when he didn't come home before darkness fell. Sebastian feebly held out his hands against the claws and the beating wings and sprang into the open door of Sebastian's truck. You don't listen very well, Anton chided. Sebastian didn't say anything other than a quietly grunted, Thanks. So, you've gotten us into a lot of trouble and revealed an important clue at the same time, Anton said. Very good work, Mr. English Hater. Sebastian was too shaken up to say anything good or bad. His world was falling apart. What was he thinking? This wasn't his world. This world, where he was a prisoner against his will? This was someone else's world, and he felt like an unwanted dog that had been staked to the back of the yard and forgotten about. And now, the family that owned the yard was in a rainbow of disarray. It was disconcerting no matter how you sliced it. Then, his heart seized up when he saw two gargoyles, just like the ones that attacked him, sitting on stone pedestals, guarding the gate to a cemetery. They didn't stir. Then, they drove by a church, and he saw more there. They kind of stuck out since they weren't quite like anything he could remember seeing in any other architecture. The sight gave him palpitations, but they remained where they were. The two men made it back to Sebastian's place. 
Sebastian was hitting the bottle. Anton was hitting the books. Sebastian was doing his best to come to terms with what he saw and experienced, and the implications of them. So he was mauled by creatures that were in the background of his everyday life for years. How long had they been watching him? Were they all gargoyles like this? Were they somehow parasitizing the populace like large stone buttflies, using living human bodies as incubators? The silence was punctuated by Anton turning pages in his books and keying things into his laptop. He didn't know he had fallen asleep until Anton shook him awake. Mr. English hater? Anton said, looking at him from over his glasses like an old man. I have something I think you will find interesting. Sebastian sat up reluctantly, not wanting to look at anything. The internet is God's gift to man these days. Minus all the bondage and torture porn, yeah? Sebastian didn't so much as flinch in response. I found here a website run by a man who is obsessed with gargoyle sculptures and memorial carvings around the world. Here are complete catalogues and photographs of all sorts of stone beasties. Now, I would like you to tell me if anything you see looks familiar, even remotely similar to the beasties that decided to interrupt your evening jog that I had advised against. Sebastian eyed his companion with a burning look as he took the laptop. He should have known that he wasn't going to get to go back to his booze and do snap anytime soon. It was... After all, an entire world's worth of centuries of sculpture. Photographs of pieces still standing in existence. Illustrations from crumbling books of monuments that were ground to sand by the passage of time centuries ago. Sebastian was losing his patience after about an hour and a half. He had figured out the keyboard shortcuts on Anton's laptop and was cycling through photos as fast as the machine would load them on Internet Explorer running on Windows XP. Anton knew the answer before Sebastian finally set the laptop down and threw his hands up in frustration. No such thing, eh? He said, smiling. Nothing. Not one of those pictures came close. Makes you think there's possibility there could be something other than gargoyles. The cuckoo bird in humanity's nest. Sneakily hiding in plain sight, yeah? Sebastian could feel everything he had just been trying to drink away come back in a hurry like a surging wave of nausea. This is too crazy. Way, way, way too crazy! He threw one hand against his scalp before standing up, shaking his head and pacing in a circle. So, unless we're sharing the same hallucination... You're selling me on the idea that there are creatures that are posing as gargoyles by hiding next to real gargoyles? This is close enough for where we are now, I suppose. So, are you planning on seeing if these things can be killed? The way things have gone so far, you're probably going to propose that we liberate all of England and hunt down every pseudo-gargoyle we can find. I actually wasn't thinking quite along those lines, but... You propose an interesting idea, Anton said. No, 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 I, did, I didn't actually mean... You make a good case. We will need to defend ourselves from the fully grown stone demons, if not for the people all around us. So it would be wise to make sure that these creatures can even be brought down. For all we know, they don't bleed like us. They look like stone. Perhaps their entire biology is stone-based whereas we are flesh-based. I have a good hunting rifle that we can use to snipe at some of our rock-faced little munchkins, eh? And so the two men sat in Anton's truck outside the gates to a cemetery they had passed earlier. The gate was black and imposing. The gargoyles that were perched atop the two stone pillars were probably black at one point in time, but the elements had flecked them with gray and green. The thing was, these gargoyles were similar to the ones that had ambushed Sebastian, so their disguise was nearly perfect. Sebastian doubted his own senses in the matter. These creatures looked every bit like they should have been original sculptures, not creatures that were part of some strange conspiracy cooked up by the lost son of Hitler. 
Anton drummed his palms on the steering wheel. So we have been here a long time, and no motion from our little friends. Sebastian nodded. Uh, shoot one? What? Uh, shoot one of them. See what happens. Sebastian shrugged. What did he have to lose? He made sure that a cartridge was chambered before taking aim at one of the two gargoyles. He felt a twang of conscience, like he was sixteen and holding a spray can to a brick wall of a public building for the first time. Defacing other people's property was not his thing. He pulled the trigger. He expected a spray of concrete or stone or... whatever. That isn't what happened. There was blood. A cloud of it. The gargoyle whimpered as it fell over with a shattered eggshell of a cranium and face planted in the turf just in front of its pillar. Sebastian delayed for half a second before he chambered another round and fired at the other gargoyle that was just beginning to react to the reality of its fallen comrade. The cartridge punctured its chest and exploded out of its back. It fell backwards into the cemetery, where it floundered for a few moments before going still. Anton leapt out of the truck and raced over to pick up the body of the first gargoyle. His movements indicated that it was every bit as heavy as it would have been if it were a stone sculpture. Englishmen started appearing over the hillside. For science, Anton said as he hauled the bulk of the dead thing into the back of the truck. Sebastian felt the back of the truck sink low. By the time they got moving, the roadside was starting to teem with people. We might not get to take the next semester of Mad Scientist 101, Sebastian said, as every vehicle in a hundred mile radius began to stop and turn towards them. A small sports car sped towards the truck as if it were a kamikaze fighter plane. It wiped out against a tree at a skewered angle to where Anton was. We just might have to skip town entirely, Mr. Wolf. Not without my dogs. Huh, they've got to be shitting me. Dog shitting me. My dogs are my family. I can't just leave my family behind. Sebastian wailed. Anton rolled his eyes and dodged three oncoming cars as he tried to pick a route to Sebastian's apartment. It wasn't going to be easy, as if it hadn't been clear before that the English were under the control of a single hive mind, it was morbidly evident that the entire whole of the city was converging on them. Sebastian wasn't sure if it was his imagination or what, but he swore he heard distinct sounds coming from all around him. The first was a throbbing that filled the air and even rattled the windows of the vehicle they were in. It couldn't have been. And yet, the signature rhythm was there. A heartbeat. The more the streets filled with pedestrians that gave chase on foot, the more the second sound became clear. The whole lot of them, every man, woman, and child that appeared, were chanting in unison, Jolly good. Jolly good. Jolly good. Good. The voices were layered, made up of thousands, but they spoke in perfect unison. Sebastian craned his neck to look skyward. They were up there, circling like large stone vultures. The overlords. The parasites. The gargoyles, if that's what they were even called. Sebastian had never been more grateful that he lived at the edge of town. It meant that the whole of the masses would have to come from one general direction, and Anton had gotten ahead of them by some bizarre twist of luck. Sebastian cursed as they pulled into the driveway of his flat. His dogs had fought bravely, bringing down four or five of the possessed Englishmen, each of them with mutilated throats. But only two of his dogs still stood, trembling, while the others were as still as their enemies on the lawn. Those fuckers killed my dogs! Sebastian roared. If you don't think proactively, the surviving pups will die as well, and us with them, said Anton. Sebastian fired off a few cartridges at gargoyles in anger, and this had an unexpected effect on the swarms of people. When a gargoyle died, the people were seized with spasms. The patrolling bodies that blocked any approach to the surviving dogs were without direction for a few seconds with each successful shot. 
Sebastian wasted no time in exploiting the temporary blind spot and getting his dogs into the bed of the truck. His anger sharpened his accuracy, and each swooping gargoyle got around the head, which made Mahdi's dance for blocks. It allowed Anton enough time to get beyond the reach of the mob and out to an open highway. Sebastian got out his phone and took some recordings of the furious gargoyles that dotted the sky and the chanting crowds that shrank away in the distance, ceaselessly repeating their nefarious mantra, Jolly good! Jolly good! Jolly good! He used the last few minutes of signal reception to post on Reddit and other social media. Pay attention to the gargoyles you pass every day, on your churches, on your gravestones, wherever they may be. Make sure you can identify them, place them in some span of architectural history, otherwise you may be under their control. There may even be one growing inside of you. We dug out the old well when the drought hit. 20 feet deep and bone dry since my granddad was a boy. We just never used it. Never needed to once the city put in the water lines. But this year the spring came and went with no rain. Then the summer. Then the county put a water restriction into effect and we had to do something. As farmers we depended on the income from the corn crops. One lost season and we might not be able to recover. The corn stalks were starting to wilt and we needed that water at least another month until harvest time. It was our only shot. So one hot summer day, my dad and I got to it. I'm 16, but small for my age, so my dad lowered me into the well first. I spent the day digging and my dad hauled the bucket up every time I filled it. My little brother Petey had a plastic red bucket on a rope he would lower, so I filled that too. At six, he wasn't able to help much, but he wanted to try, bless him. Our sister May kept the lemonade coming and by mid-afternoon I had dug it another 10 feet deep. And the next day we got up at dawn and went to work again, this time with some help. Corn Avery, our neighbor across the fields, had heard from his wife who talked to my mom about what we were trying to do. He sent his son Tom, who's a year older than me, to help. That day we dug another 20 feet if you can believe it. We'd planned to stop for the day after 15, but we noticed the dirt was getting softer, damp. We knew we were getting close. We were so far down, Tom and I could only hear their breathing and the sound of our shovels. It was dark and cold down there, so far from the surface. The farther we dug, the wetter the ground got, and the faster we went. During the last five feet or so, we started hearing something like an echo around us whenever the shovels hit dirt. A hollow sound, almost like we were digging on top of an empty box. Tom struck the blade down again, and we heard the chink sound of rock underneath. Let's see if we can break this rock up, otherwise it's gonna be hell to lift. We started slamming our shovel tips down as hard as we could, hoping to crack the rock so it could be moved. The rock gave way and immediately a geyser of freezing cold water spurted up, flooding the well as we were thrust upward with the blast. The well was filled with a roar of rushing water and our yells as Tom and I were torpedoed up the 50 feet to the surface. The force of the water knocking us into the sides and dragging us along the current. The last 20 feet was lined with stone and my head was cracked right into it. Everything went black. I woke to the sound of May screaming my name. Blinking, I found myself on the soaking wet ground outside the well, the hot sun warming my chilled body. Dad was bent over Tom who was bleeding real bad from his leg. He had three long deep gashes running from his calf down to his ankle and his shoe was gone. Dad said we popped up like toast with me being tossed clear out of the well and Tom draped over the side. Tom slid back in and Dad had to drag him out, probably cutting his leg up on the stone. Mom came running out and bandaged him up good. Between us, we had right many cuts and bruises, but we had water, and that was the best thing ever. We started pumping it out the very next day. The clear, cold water soaked into the parched soil as fast as we could pump it. By the time we'd soaked the fields, the stalks around the house had already perked up considerably. And it tasted good too. So clean and icy cold no matter how much we hauled up. That night I was relaxing in my room, reading a book by the open window to stay cool. It was late and I was the only one awake I think. I must have been. As I was reading it I sensed movement out of the corner of my eye. Looking up I glanced out the window. 
Nothing out there but our yard and the cornfield. Back to my reading for a moment, then I felt it again. I caught a glimpse this time. There was a rustling outside, so I knew where to look. There among the corn stalks, movement. Whatever it was, it was big. I knew that much. The way it was pushing the stalks around, it had to be a deer or a man, and we don't have deer around these parts. Slipping away from the window, I reached for my pellet gun and turned off the light. Creeping back to the window, the moonlight was all I needed. I waited, scanning the rows of corn in the darkness, watching for movement. There! It was closer to the house now and moving fast. I saw the shaking stalks partway in a line headed straight for the edge of the yard. I took aim. I sent four rounds of steel pellets right at it as it emerged. There was a blur of white and a high-pitched screech as it dove back under cover. It tore its way toward the backyard where my house cast dark shadows that I couldn't see through even in the moonlight. I jumped out my window and ran after it, rifle in hand. This thing, this creature, it moved fast. I heard a loud splash and by the time I rounded the side of the house, nothing was there. Just our big open yard surrounded by the corn and the well. It was far enough behind the house not to be in the shadows and the moon cast a path of silvery light over it, reflecting off the water that still came right to the top no matter how much we pumped. Carefully, I crept closer to peer over the edge. There was nothing there. The water was still and dark and I couldn't see beyond the surface. I waited, rifle at the ready, but nothing happened. Nothing came out. Finally, I turned to go back inside. It was then that I noticed the ground all around the well was wet. I stayed up all the next night too, watching in case whatever it was came back. There were a few rustles out in the stalks, but nothing big. I shot a few pellets at any that came too close to my side of the house, just to be sure. The next day was spent watering and pulling weeds. Our crops were doing really well with the water. The once drying corn stalks had quickly turned to lush green and our tomatoes were growing at a surprisingly fast rate. Mom even picked some of the largest hand-sized green ones to fry up with dinner. Last week, those same ones had barely been an inch or two around. I asked Dad about it. Well, son, the water's probably full of minerals. The way it always comes up ice cold and there's so much of it, I bet a dollar to ten that there's a big reservoir under there. That could easily run under the rock bed for miles, carving out natural caves and leaching all the minerals from the rocks. It's no wonder the plants love it. <laughs> I guessed he was right and left it at that, but I didn't have any appetite for tomatoes at dinner. That night it was pitch dark outside. I was exhausted, so I stretched out on the bed for some rest instead of keeping a lookout. But I kept my air rifle next to me to be safe. Sometime later, I bolted upright in bed, awoken by a loud thump outside my window. I was so scared that the hairs on the back of my neck stood stiff, but my family was in this house, and I wasn't about to let anything cause them harm. Fumbling for my rifle, I crawled across the bed towards the window. Standing now, back pressed to the wall right beside the window sill, I slowly craned my head to look out. It sounded like, like a big animal bumping the side of the house. It reminded me of a mare or a large dog. How their body kind of casually knocks into things when they're moving around and distracted. Unfortunately, I'd gone to bed with the window shut tonight, so I couldn't lean out at all to see over the edge, nor point my rifle. I reached for the latch. No sooner had the lock popped open than there was a loud snort and a squeal as the thing took off along the side of the house. I heard it hit the wraparound porch and run across toward the back. There was no time to bother with the window. I ran down the hall and burst through the side door onto the porch. I could see it, already running through the yard, headed for the well. Even in the dark, its pasty white skin was easy to see. The creature was fast, darting strangely on all fours as if it weren't used to moving this way. The limbs didn't move in rhythm like a normal animal running. They were clumsy and wobbly, and they didn't look like animal legs. They looked human, like arms and legs bent at weird angles. I ran after it across the porch, raising my rifle as it neared the well, when all of a sudden something was under my feet. I tripped as it got tangled in my flailing legs and I went down hard. I heard the deep splash on my way down. The creature had gotten away again. Frustrated and bruised, I lay panting on the porch. It was cold and damp. I sat up, realizing the porch was wet. In the moonlight, I could make out a thick trail of darkness that wet the wood. 
the path stretched all the way to the end of the side porch where my window sat a few feet further down the side of the house. Leaning back, I could see it went all the way down the other side as well, and the dark splotches following the porch as it wrapped around the back. Using my arms to brace myself, I pushed up the stand. My foot grazed something, and I carefully reached down into the dark to find what had tripped me. Holding it up to the light, it was a ripped-up tennis shoe. That was last night. Today, Dad, Petey, and I were picking tomatoes together, so I finally told my dad the whole thing. I thought he'd be on my side. We'd go out to the well and drain it, see what was inside, or board it up, something. But he didn't believe me. All right. So you saw a raccoon. That's not unusual. It wasn't a raccoon. It was really big. Okay, a dog then. What you saw was probably no more than a big dog out for a midnight run. Cool, a dog. I wonder where he lives. Probably one of the neighboring farms, son. But dad, it wasn't a dog. I tried to explain, but he just wasn't listening. Enough, son. Think about what nonsense you're spouting. He brushed past me, arms full with a bushel of tomatoes for Mr. Avery, who was coming over to look at the new well. It was an especially big bushel, as it was also an apology for Tom's injury. His mom had talked to my mom, who told my dad that the scratches on Tom's leg had gotten infected, and he was laid up in bed all week. But what about the well, Dad? I saw it go in the well. My dad turned and set me with a stony gaze. You watch what you're saying, son. You just watch it. That well has been nothing but a blessing. A blessing we needed. We're damn sure not gonna board it up because some dog went for a swim and you got spooked. You don't go shooting your air rifle at it and you don't go making up stories. I'll not have you saying these things around your mom and the kids getting them worked up over nothing. And you at best not say anything around corn either. His wife's already in a bad state over Tom, and they were good enough to help us when we needed it. This nonsense stops now. And with that, he walked out to meet Mr. Avery's truck as he drove in. I wish we had a dog. <sighs> it wasn't a dog. And with that, I went back inside. I stayed up all night tonight, determined to prove my dad wrong and get to the bottom of this whole mess. I didn't even bother with sitting on my bedroom window. Tonight, I was right by the front door, cracked open a bit so I could sit behind it and peek out. Sure enough, soon after the moon was out, I heard it. A rustling sound coming from somewhere outside and a heavy thump of something pulling itself onto the porch. My pellet gun was loaded. I slowly stood up and got ready. Not yet. With only a little opening in the door, it was hard to tell what direction the sounds were coming from. I had to be sure. There! A wet gurgling hiss sounded to the left. I burst out through the door, firing shots wildly toward the sound. The thing screeched and leapt off the porch with me in hot pursuit. It galloped with its strange legs along the side of the house, pausing to look back as it cleared the corner. Standing still in the moonbeam, I had a clear shot of it finally. But I couldn't move. I couldn't stop staring. The thing, it, it was as tall as a man, thin, hairless, with slippery, fish-belly white skin. The fingers and toes were elongated, with thin membranes webbing between them, and tipped with thick claws. And its face, never have I seen anything so wrong. It had no ears, nose, eyebrows, not even eye sockets, because it had no eyes. Just smooth flesh and a thin wrinkle of skin that may have been eyelids somewhere along its evolution. The mouth, it took up most of the face, pushing the nasal slits almost to opposite sides of the head. The thick muscular ring pulsed like a suction cup over sharp needle-like teeth. It offered a wet growl before bounding around the house. The thing running snapped me out of my paralysis and I ran after it, popping rounds at it even as it dove into the corn stalks. I could still hear it rustling around, but the stalks were so thick, there was no way my simple pellets could hit. I heard a muffled sound to my left. Raising my rifle, I spun around. Did you catch him, Martin? Did you get the dog? My little brother Petey stood about 20 feet away in his pajamas, his dark silhouette illuminated by the small lamp shining from his open bedroom window. 
No, Petey, it's not safe out here. Get back inside, right? The creature leapt out of the stalks and grabbed my little brother. Petey screamed and thrashed as the monster latched its foul mouth over his neck and began dragging him backwards on all fours. No! I hurled forward as fast as I could after them into the backyard. I couldn't shoot the thing. I might hit my brother. As he called out to me, his little hands outstretched for me to save him. I chased them across the yard, the creature hissing and growling as it quickly drug Petey like a rag doll toward the well. Out of nowhere, something slammed into my side, knocking me to the ground. It was then that I realized there were more than one of them. A wet, heavy thing pinned me down as I struggled to roll over. I kicked and yelled and struck at it anywhere I could reach as its thick, rubbery mouth latched onto my bare arm. It felt like a thousand burning needles stabbing into my skin as it bit down. I screamed and kicked, catching it at the center of its chest, dislodging it from my arm. The creature reared back on its haunches, straddling me. My blood ringed its mouth as it let out a screech of rage. Its head exploded in a shower of greasy muck. The gunshot rang in my ears as I scrambled from under the fallen corpse. The next moment my father was there, strong hands pulling me to my feet. He was yelling something at me, but I couldn't hear him. My thoughts were on Petey and the well. Dad! I pulled from his grip and stumbled toward the back of the house. I could barely stand. My arm where I was bitten had gone completely numb. With the sensation traveling down my leg as I tried to keep my balance. Petey! They got Petey! My father ran past me around the side of the house, shouting my brother's name. I heard him screaming. Two more gunshots. Then nothing. I drug myself as fast as I could around the house, shouting for Petey, my dad, my mom, anyone to hear me. As I stumbled around the corner, I saw something that will haunt me more than anything I have seen or experienced tonight, or will ever experience for the rest of my life, God willing that I live long enough. Two forms lay together in the grass, one of the creatures blown apart by a shotgun blast, and my father, his throat torn open. On the edge of the well lay my poor brother. He'd stopped screaming now and hung limp, staring ahead at nothing as he was pulled the rest of the way underwater. I collapsed on the ground, crying. I had no more energy, no more fight inside of me. I just couldn't bear it. Little Petey, my dad, I wanted to just lay there and let the creatures take me. I deserved as much. If I'd just shut my mouth around Petey or made my dad stay up with me to see the creatures before they became so bold... Suddenly, my thoughts were broken by the sound of more screaming. My mom, my sister May, they were screaming and calling my name, begging me to get up. I raised my head and struggled to my knees. They were standing, huddled together in their nightgowns, looks of complete horror on their dear faces, except they weren't looking at me or the body of my dad. They were staring towards the cornfield. The cold numbness had completely taken over my left arm and leg, but I crawled forward, dragging the lifeless limbs. I called to them, and soon they were at my sides, pulling me up. I stared into my mom's wide-eyed, panic-stricken face. We have to get to the truck. As they drug me along, I could see ripples of water coming up from the well. Hurry! I willed myself to move faster. My mother kept looking over at the cornfields. My vision was starting to blur, but I stared hard and eventually made out the shape of another of the creatures crouched just behind the first stalks. It was about half the size of the others, and even though it growled and hissed, seemed unwilling to attack without them. We made it to the truck. My mom got in first, pulling me across the passenger side as she took the wheel. My sister slid in beside me. The engine revved, tires squealed and kicked up gravel as we tore down our driveway, headed for the main road. We lived so far out of town. With what gas we had left in the tank, everyone in shock and my wound still bleeding out, I don't blame my mom for what she did. Not at all. Instead of trying to make it to the town, she pulled the truck into the nearest farm over, about five miles from our house. The Averys. We sped up the driveway, mom laying on the horn the whole way. It's the middle of the night, but by the time we screech to a halt right at their front porch, the lights are on in the house and Mr. Avery's at the door looking out. We must have looked like we felt because he immediately moved the side to let us in, slamming and locking the door behind us. They helped me into a chair by the front window as Mr. Avery tried to work out what was wrong with us. We all started talking and shouting at once, desperate to be heard. They came out. Those things. Dad, Petey. 
a reservoir underneath this whole area. Caves. Caves. The well. They came up from the well. Mr. Avery and his wife stared at me. Everything gone silent. Did... Did... Did, did you say the well, boy? Mr. Avery stammered as he staggered forward, looking past me out the window. I struggled to turn in my seat to see where he was looking. Out in the yard, there was a huge mound of earth right next to their freshly dug well. The woman gasped and screamed, but I could only stare as a pale, clawed hand reached over the edge. One thing I'll give Mr. Avery credit for is he doesn't waste time. Me, I had to be curious, had to go investigate. But him, he saw that thing crawling up out of the well and he took charge. I think that's what saved us. Both to the back. As he shouted, he looped my paralyzed arm over his neck and lifted me up. We all ran to the back room of the house, Tom's room. Corn tossed me in an overstuffed chair next to Tom's bed in the corner. Then he went to work immediately securing the door. The shock, the blood loss, everything caught up to me and my head began to swim. I turned to look at Tom as I blacked out. How he lay there with his eyes closed and mouth hung open wide, breathing heavily. He was so pale and all his hair had fallen out. That was an hour or so ago. I'm awake now, writing this. My wounds are bandaged by Miss Avery and the numbing cold finally seeping out of my system. It hurts to move, the whole side of my body racked with intense pins and needles sensation. You see, they were productive while I was unconscious. The windows have been boarded up and there's a pile of canned food and bottles of water stacked on the floor. The door is barricaded with a bookshelf and Mr. Avery leans against it. Miss Avery, my mom and May sit huddled together on the rug, crying softly. Outside I can hear the creatures, scratching, hissing, slamming themselves against the windows. It won't be long before they get inside the house. Over in the corner, Tom's starting to growl. Chilling tales for dark nights.